Hi, everyone, and welcome to today's Pivotal webinar. I'm your host, Jeff Kelly. Today, we'll hear from two Pivotal data scientists about their experience working with Pivotal clients using data science to support software product development. Before we get started, I just want to remind everyone that you can ask questions throughout today's webinar in the chat box. Our presenters will spend a few minutes at the end of the presentation answering as many questions as they can. Now, let me introduce today's presenters. Regu Radhakrishnan is a principal data scientist within the data science team at Pivotal, where he helps customers derive business value from data with a special focus on IT security, operations, and fraud detection. Prior to Pivotal, he held research positions at Dolby Laboratories and Mitsubishi Electric Research Labs. He received his Master's of Science and PhD degrees in Electrical Engineering from Polytechnic University in Brooklyn, New York. His research interests include statistical machine learning, video summarization, multimedia content identification, watermarking, and spatial audio. Joining Raghu is Vatsan Ramanujam. Vatsan is a principal data scientist at Pivotal, where he executes data science labs for customers with a special focus on text analytics. Previously, as a data scientist at Sony Mobile Communications in Redwood City, he led Sony Mobile's data science initiatives that span across statistical machine learning and natural language processing. Before joining Sony, he was an engineer in the analytics team at Salesforce. He received a master's in computer science from the University of Texas at Austin, completing his thesis and research in natural language, language processing, where he focused on graphical models for weekly supervised sequence predictions, prediction problems. With that, I will turn it over to Raghu and Watson uh, for their presentation. Take it away, guys. Thanks, everyone. My name is Watson, and I'm here with my colleague. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining. So today's agenda looks like so. So we'll start off by describing the motivation behind the problem that we are presenting. We'll talk a little bit about the customer profile and the data science pro opportunity we encountered with them. And then we'll go into great depth about the data science models that we built to derive business value for our customers. And towards the end, we'll summarize some findings and how this impacted the business of our customers, and then we'll take questions. So the motivation is pretty clear for most of you. Software is eating the world, as you may have been reading in blogs and other social channels. A lot of the applications that you use, like Uber, Facebook, Netflix, Google, have a software at its core, and in many instances, data science is what drives a lot of these software innovations. In order to stay ahead of competition and to add business value, you need a mechanism to identify what is the next best feature you'd like to introduce in the software. And there are many ways of going about it. And data science is one way in which you can identify what's the next cool thing that your users are looking for. And it can help you build that and achieve increased usage, expand to new users, and whatnot. So when we work with our customers, the typical data science driven product innovation life cycle looks like so. We often have a web application built by application engineers that is customer facing. The data from this web application gets collected and ingested into a data lake. From where a data science team does analytics. This could involve identifying unique user patterns, identifying anomalies, or figuring out what's the next best thing that we should offer to our customers. Now, once these models have been built and you've gathered insights, you'd like to push these results back into the application so that it helps those users. With that in mind, we went in to work for a certain customer of ours who's in the financial services space. The web application in this case was in the domain of financial services. You can imagine using such a web application or a mobile application to get information about securities, look up what market forces could impact the price of these securities, look up information about trading information about these securities, and so on and so forth. Now, for each user, 
there is a certain sort of license that they subscribe to. And this particular customer had millions of such subscribers. The information that they had collected was instrumented inside the application. So they had information about what were their users requesting, what securities were they interested in, what was the amount of bytes that came out of the application to the user's computer, how much information was pushed back to the application, the time of request, you know, and certain other features like the subscriber information. So they had about billions, couple of billion rows of records in three months worth of time. And the data science opportunity that we, were, we, we worked on is essentially identifying different usage profiles from such request logs. Now you can imagine this being useful for cross-sell or upsell. Perhaps if you are a user who's exhibiting behavior which is typical of a certain customer profile and you're subscribed to a different kind of license, you have the opportunity to basically you know, uh, recommend to this user that they choose a different kind of license. Or you have the opportunity to recommend that they upgrade to a better license because their usage you know, requires some advanced features. You could also identify potential fraud and product misuse. Often when you subscribe to a certain license for such a financial services application, it comes with certain agreements. For instance, you are bounded by a certain number of requests you can submit in any given month. You are not allowed to download data which exceeds a certain amount, so on and so forth. Often what could happen is a user might try to circumvent such limitations. So for instance, if your organization has 10 users who have subscribed to this application and you're downloading some information about securities, now you as an individual user might have a limitation of only you know, a couple of megabytes worth of download in any given day. But you could tag team with your colleague who might also have a subscription and log in through their account and download another couple of megabytes worth of data and then try and combine this and maintain a database of your own. Now, this might be legitimate. If it is legitimate, you might want to recommend to these two users that, hey, there is a higher license category that you can subscribe to, and you can make that recommendation. Now, if this is malicious, you can identify and notify users who are violating the terms of their agreement. All of these could be detected using data science by analyzing the request information that the customers had instrumented their application to collect. For this particular customer, we built several different data science models, and we'll talk through them in detail. But we were successful in delivering business value to our customer primarily because of the scalable platform and the data science toolkits we had access to. For any data science engagement that Pivotal Data Science Team works on, we typically have three different platforms, and we choose the one which best fits the customer's needs. For instance, we have an enterprise data warehouse called Greenplum. We have a Hadoop native SQL engine called Hawk. And then we also have an in-memory data grid called Gemfire. Now, our enterprise data warehouse, including Greenplum and Hawk, have access to various analytical toolkits that data scientists frequently use. And we typically make use of a distributed in-database machine learning library called Madlib, which contains all the data science algorithms that you know, a team would generally use available in a scalable fashion. We also often harness Python and R libraries 
and make them run on parallel on top of our platform. And in order to communicate our insights through data visualizations and whatnot, we often use Python and R libraries. In Python, it is Cburn or Matplotlib. In R, we frequently use ggplot2. And we communicate all our insights to our customers using Jupyter Notebooks. So here's a snapshot of the different functionality available, available in our machine learning library called Madlib. You can see that it's got a whole lot of supervised algorithms, unsupervised algorithms, which are things we used in this engagement time series analysis, and a lot of implementation for linear algebra operations are also available in MATLAB. In addition to MATLAB, for this particular engagement, we also used a product called PDL Tools. This is a collection of utility functions that the Pivotal Data Science and Data Engineering teams wrote and maintained so that for common workflows, we don't reinvent the wheel, and our customers get the benefit of not having to start from scratch. Often when we work with large enterprises, we have users with different skill sets. For instance, you may have business analysts, you will have data scientists, you will have application developers, and data engineers. Now each of them come with a different sort of skill set, and you should be able to cater to all of their skill sets so that your analytics environment is usable by them. So in scenarios where you have someone who's more familiar with drag and drop tools for data science, we often work with partners and Alpine Data Labs is one such partner of ours. They have a visual workflow where a data scientist can simply drag and drop operators and build pipelines without having to write custom code. With that summary of our toolkit, I'd like to hand it over to my colleague, Regu, who will talk you through in detail about the modeling approach and present what insights we gathered. Thank you, Watson, for the nice introduction. Um, we will look at all the models that we built um, for this customer um, based on the request logs they provided for this particular web app. So this request log had information on uh, when, the when the subscriber requested the information, bytes in, bytes out, and um, and what he requested, right? So the first thing we want to do is take all this subscriber activity and uh, convert them into sessions. And we'll show how we actually did that. And once we have the sessions, then each of those sessions can be represented using some features that that are characteristic of those sessions. And once we have the features, then we can try a couple of different approaches for uh, clustering those sessions into groups. Here is the complete workflow that we developed, data science workflow that we developed for this customer. On the left side, you see the API request logs coming in. And the first thing that happens is um, each of those requests get assigned to sessions. And then from each of the sessions, we extract features to represent those sessions. And um, we use k-means clustering as one alternative. And then we have a topic modeling-based clustering as another alternative to do clustering of those sessions. And finally, once we validate the clusters with the business uh, users, then for any incoming session, we'd be able to assign to uh, one of those clusters so that they can uh, they can quickly review whether an incoming session falls into one of those known patterns which are represented by the cl clusters and if there is, if there is a incoming session that doesn't fit any of those uh, pre-identified patterns then it is um, it is flagged for review for a, by a, by a team who would then decide whether this particular customer needs a different subscription or may, they may think about a feature to address that customer's need. So this is the whole point of this uh, framework that we delivered for, for this customer. Now let's take a deeper look at how we actually did the sessionization. Typically, in a web request, sessionization is completely based on timeouts. So you have a bunch of requests coming along the timeline. 
and based on a timeout threshold, you would divide those into different sessions. But in this case, the customer actually wanted something different. He said, uh, they told us that if two requests, even though they are separate apart in time, if they are of the same kind, then they should actually belong in one, one session. So based on that reasoning, we first had to do request clustering based on what is in those requests, and then identify, um, tag those incoming requests with, the, with those cluster IDs. And then in addition to the time timeout, we uh, group things that are closer in time as well as if they have the same look and feel, then they belong in the same session. Similarly, uh, if two, two groups of requests, even though they are close in time, if they if they have different characteristics, then then they should belong in two different sessions, and that's what would happen with this type of uh, um, sessionization that we did. So this this is just a slight twist on the usual sessionization that um, uh, that is used for web requests, and um, the PDL tools that uh, Watson had mentioned earlier has the timeout based sessionization built in, because this is a customized thing. We had to uh, develop something new for this customer. Now let's take a look at how we actually did the clustering with those session representations. So these are some features that we extracted to represent each of the sessions. We looked at the number of requests, number of hits, meaning uh, how many uh, items were requested, the number of securities and the fields that they requested for each of the sessions. And then we also looked at the duration of the session and the bytes in and bytes out. These are like simple scalar features. And then we also looked at what type of securities are being requested in each session. So that will look like a distribution. If there are 10, 15 possible groups of items, then we just look at what is the percentage of items that fall into those different buckets. So those are distribution features. And uh, by doing this, we had about um, uh, uh, hundreds of features in the, in the feature space. And then we used uh, k-means to do the clustering. And we had about 39 million sessions after all the sessionizations. And we, without Madly, we, we would not have been able to do this on a normal platform, right, um, be, with the scale of uh, the number of points, we, we definitely needed um, the scalable machine learning tool that runs on Greenplum to do this uh, clustering. Yeah, and MATLAB has two options. The, one, uh, the first option is called k-means k random, where it starts with a random set of seeds and then converges to the centroids of the uh, k-cluster that you're asking for. But we also had a variant called k-means++, plus plus, which is k-means pp. Uh, inside MATLAB, what it does is it can take an initial list of centroids and can converge faster. So in order to do that, what we did was we took a small random sample and ran k-means on that random sample to get an initial list of centroids, and then uh, fed it to this k-means plus plus algorithm to get faster convergence. And in order to get the uh, uh, optimal number of clusters. We, we tried um, several number of uh, clusters, starting from 20 up to 400. Uh, that, that's what you see in the x-axis. And then for each of those, we compute the cluster goodness measure called simple silhouette score, which measures how close are the points to their own centroid as opposed to the neighboring centroid, and a number that's closer to one indicates better clustering. And we ran both k-means and k-means++, plus plus, um, with the k-means++ plus plus converging much faster and, and returning faster. And in both cases, we found that the number of clusters kind of converged to uh, a number called about, about 400. And then we looked at the cluster size distribution, uh, visualized that in, in this, in this uh, figure we are seeing here. Uh, you can notice that about 95% of the sessions were captured in, in the top 62 clusters, or top 162 clusters, and the biggest cluster had about 
4 million sessions. And uh, we started looking into each of these clusters, what they are comprised of to get an insight into uh, into the type of behaviors that are captured in, the, in each of these clusters. I think this I already covered, like uh, top 162 clusters explain 95% of all the sessions. The other um, tail of the distribution is also interesting to the customer because it has some outliers, and uh, this is where they might find some anomalous usage of their product. So we, we did both the cluster analysis to identify typical usage patterns and the outliers to, uh, to basically show them what, what could be the fraudulent usage or misusage, misusage of the product. So one way to look at uh, the clusters is we look, we look at all the sessions that fall in a cluster, and we also know who requested those sessions, and we have the corresponding customer profile information. So we could show the uh, membership of each of those clusters in a, in a word cloud to our customer for each of the top clusters. So for example, the uh, type one cluster Type top, the cluster one had type one user who typically ex exhibit their behavior in the sessions that are captured in cluster one. And similarly, type four customer could be the um, uh, most prevalent customer in cluster two. And this could be like uh, equity analyst and fixed, fixed income analyst. They, they would have different uh, behavior in terms of what they are requesting from the product and that would be captured in this, in, in this type of uh, 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 word cloud to show the, uh, to understand the details of who are the customers who are requesting uh, the sessions in these clusters. Similarly, we also looked at the features when, within each of those top clusters. For example, the uh, cluster on the left top uh, had more number of requests than the other types of uh, clusters. And similarly, um, there was another cluster which had higher number of bytes out, meaning they are downloading a lot more stuff. And so this way we can identify what, what, is the, what is the characteristic for each of those clusters in terms of the features that we set out to describe. So that brings us to the end of the first clustering approach where we just represented each of the sessions uh, using a, a bunch of features and then did uh, straightforward k-means clustering on it. The second workflow uh, used a common technique in document clustering literature called uh, LDA, uh, where we use um, um, a generative model to describe a document. Each document is uh, associated with a distribution over topics, and then each topic has a distribution over a, over a set of words. So for each of the words in a document, then you first look up the uh, topic ID based on the topic distribution assigned to that document, and then uh, and then um, draw a word that is according to that for a pick topic. So that way you are describing the whole document using the topic distribution vector and the um, topic word distribution vector for each topic. So with LDA, given a set of documents in, in the bag of words form, where each document is represented by the words, present in the document and the count, you can ask it to find the uh, commonly occurring topics uh, from that document collection, and then describe each of the document using those uh, topic distribution proportions. And uh, we took this approach uh, in this uh, approach uh, where we wanted to draw the analogy of document to the session and the words in the document are analogous to the item category that the uh, user is requesting. So you can think of the, you can uh, think of representing each session as uh, word counts, where the words are item categories and how many times 
they requested something from that item category. With this representation, we, we were able to run LDA to identify topics. And now these topics would make sense because certain uh, word item categories would that tend to occur together would get clubbed into one topic. So if you're an equity analyst and you're requesting topics, uh, requesting certain item categories together, then they would get clubbed into one topic. And then all your uh, behavior can be tracked with those K topics instead of a huge number of item categories. So in order to select the number of topics to uh, to to do the LDA, we um, we compute something to similar to the silhouette coefficient. Here it's called the perplexity, which is the um, which is the um, which is related to the likelihood of all the all the words um, all the words in, in your in, in your document uh, given the current model, and you basically try to pick the model that would least complex model that provides a better explanation of the data. So we, we want the perplexity to be lower and likely to, likelihood to be higher, but you want to pick the model that has the least complexity. So in order to do that, we vary the number of topics from uh, 10 to 100, and then we compute the perplexity measure for each of those number of topics. And, and as you can see, after say 30, 35, then the perplexity doesn't go down as much, meaning the likelihood doesn't go down, doesn't increase as much. And so you pick 35 as your 30 or 35 as your uh, number of topics for to describe this kind of collection of documents. And for each of those topics, you can now visualize. Uh, what is in those topics uh, using a word cloud, uh, which is standard, right? For topic one, you can say that it has uh, um, item two is more prevalent, and each the word size is proportional to the probability that that particular item category appears in that topic. So this way, when we showed to the, when we showed it to our customer, they said these topics make sense, and then now they can map the customer behavior in terms of uh, these topics instead of uh, going to the item categories. And for example, um, here we have an equity analyst as an example, and we have on the x-axis the 30 topics, and uh, the uh, the distribution here shows on a particular um, time period, what are the, we look at the number of sessions that this equity analyst is performing um, based on the request, and then we assign topics to those uh, individual items in those um, sessions, and then compute the topic distribution for that whole uh, set of sessions for that particular user. And this way you can see the the yeah, behavior pattern very different for equity analysts versus fixed income analysts, and these topics made sense to to the customer. And now they can look at an interday usage pattern by a subscriber. Say on the x-axis you have the uh, day index, and then on the y-axis you have the topic index going from one through thirty, and then each cell represents. Uh, the percentage of time he's he's um, uh, uh, doing ex exhibiting those topic uh, to topic sessions. Similarly, you can look at the intraday usage pattern by a subscriber, uh, where here we can look at at a session level whether um, he's be exhibiting different topic usage patterns. Um, just to give some numbers on the uh, uh, after, after we after we did the um, topic distribution representation for the session, then we can again do k-means clustering uh, to get clusters based on this representation as opposed to just relying on the raw features. Here again, we had um, 39 million sessions as documents. 
and the vocabulary size, the item categories was about 7929, right? So now we are reducing the dimensionality from 7929 to 30, just 30, and then doing came in on that 30-dimensional uh, feature vector, uh, which is the topic distribution for each of the sessions. And then eventually we also did the uh, cluster um, uh, interpretation for all of those uh, clusters that came out of the LDA-based clustering approach as a, and also for the K-means approach. And then for an incoming session, we use LDA predict to find the topic distribution for the incoming session. And then we can assign uh, a risk score to based on the K clusters that we have already identified. Based on, we can compute a risk score based on how close it is to the centroid of, of each of those clusters. And if, if a particular um, incoming session doesn't fit into any of those clusters, then it would be very far away from the centroid for each of those clusters that we've identified, thereby um, showing to our customer that this is a new usage pattern that is emerging that doesn't fit into any of those case buckets, and that would be reviewed, and they can take action based on what they are seeing within those, uh, within those new emerging clusters. So in summary, um, to wrap up this modeling um, work that we, that we just shared, we have developed uh, we, we developed two clustering approaches to identify typical usage pa pa patterns of the customers. One is just based on sessionization followed by representing those sessions with raw features and doing k-means on top of it. The other approach is just doing um, topic modeling to first identify uh, the topics, and then representing each of those sessions with topic distribution vectors, and then running k-means. And we showed that the topic content is meaningful, and they can be they they can capture what type of uh, item categories or equities or access together by a particular usage uh, profile. Somebody like an equity analyst what would be the topics that he would be touching as opposed to a fixed in command list. And uh, that, uh, that kind of um, uh, insight the, the customer was very um, appreciative of because they, were, they had to look at a huge number of item categories to understand their behavior. Now they just have a smaller vocabulary to uh, understand usage behavior. And finally, we showed a way to compute risk scores for incoming sessions so that they can identify emerging uh, patterns uh, for the usage, usage data. With that, I will uh, hand over to Watson for the uh, concluding remarks. Thank you, Raghu. So to summarize, we spoke about this product innovation pipeline, right? You have a customer-facing web app. You've instrumented it to collect some useful information that gets ingested into a data lake, and your data science team does analytics on that data, and then they push back those insights so that the next version of the app has better features for the, for the users. So in, in a sense, in addition to demonstrating the value of data science to increase or to add new features to their product, we also showed that the platform of choice for building all these data science models and analysis can cater to users with multiple skill sets. We spoke about the skills pyramid earlier, where you have data scientists who are most hands-on. They have a familiarity with a large collection of tools. They know SQL. They're fluent in Python and R-like languages. Now you need an environment which caters to their wide array of skills so that they feel that, okay, this platform is powerful enough and flexible enough for my needs. You also need to cater to data analysts who may not be too familiar with scripting languages, but perhaps they are familiar with SQL uh, and, and they are familiar with some data visualization tools like Tableau. And then you have statisticians who may not be familiar with SQL 
but they are familiar with some scripting languages or they might be comfortable using some graphical user interface based toolkits for building machine learning pipelines. And ultimately, you have business analysts who might want to consume reports or dashboards. Now, the platform that we presented for this uh, uh, in this presentation and we worked on for this customer was Greenplum, and it catered to all of these different user personas in the skills pyramid. We partnered with Alpine so that business analysts could build data science pipelines. And when you want to build some sort of reports or data visualization dashboards, you can use Tableau. All of these work really well with Greenplum. So that, in summary, is uh, you know our, our story of how we showed value that data science brought to the table for this customer, and we helped them improve their product by identifying opportunities for cross-selling and upselling, and also identifying when there was certain anomalous activity in, in the usage profile uh, on, on a daily basis. With that, we'd like to hand it off to Jeff. Okay, thanks guys. That was a, a great presentation. Uh, we now have uh, some time for questions. A reminder, if you, if you do have questions, you can still input those in the chat box um, on your uh, webinar console. Um, but let's get into it. So. Uh, our first question, guys, has to do with uh, data volume. So the question is, how much was the size of input data for k-means algorithm that was running uh, in a distributed fashion? And maybe if you could expand also on just kind of the, the impact of uh, data volumes as you're uh, doing data science projects related to software development, uh, software product development. Got it, Jeff. So um, the request logs were just they just shared the request log for three months, and that had about five billion five billion rows. And after sessionization, that number came down to 39 million. And so K-means was actually ran on 39 million uh, 39 million rows and uh, hundreds of features representing for for each uh, representing each uh, session. So it's like a matrix of 39 million rows and column size is in the order of hundreds. And we had to run it overnight um, because we were trying different uh, values for the K in the K means. And we computed the silhouette coefficient for each of those Ks, as we showed earlier, and picked the optimal uh, number of um, uh, centroids for the K means clustering. So to add to that, um, the, the library that we used in this case was Madlib. So Madlib has a distributed implementation of k-means because k-means is an iterative algorithm and it is easily distributable. And all of these uh, computations were implemented in C++. We harnessed, uh, Madlib itself harnesses uh, a lot of linear algebra libraries. It uses boost graph libraries, so on and so forth. So those lower level libraries are highly efficient themselves. And on top of that, when you write a distributed implementation on an MPP environment like Greenplum, you get an end result, which is you know, uh, an algorithm which runs super fast so that you don't have to go and grab a coffee every time you run it. Right. OK, great. Um, our next question has to do with uh, NLP. Could you talk a little bit about the uh, NLP capabilities uh, that you've worked with and, and that are available specifically from, uh, from Pivotal? That's a great question, uh, Jeff. So we have a couple of different tools that we use for harnessing you know, natural language processing capabilities. So the primary toolkit that we use uh, is Madlib again. It has some NLP algorithms implemented in it. We have LDA-based topic models, and we have a stemming module, for instance, the rest are you know, generic algorithms. So once you've, let's say, you're doing some sort of document clustering, once you've computed something like a term frequency, inverse document frequency vector, you can then use the clustering algorithms in Madlib to you know, proceed. We also have a product called GPTEXT, which is more of a search and retrieval toolkit. 
it's based on Solar, but it's a distributed implementation. So if you want some sort of an interface where you have, let's say, a, a database table with you know, millions and billions of rows of, textu of textual data, and you want to index that so that for uh, every search you, you get you know, the relevant rows. So GP text takes care of that, and you can query your data using a SQL-like interface. In addition to that, we spoke about the Python and R libraries that we can harness on top of you know, our, our, our platform. So to, in Python, we often use SkyFit uh, Learn. Uh, that's not an NLP library in itself, but it has a lot of useful algorithms. We have natural language toolkit called NLTK. There's also a library called Spacey, uh, which is a very popular you know, NLP library. So those are some of the Python libraries we use. In R, there are countless libraries to name. Additionally, we also support PL Java, which is procedural, another procedural language extension. This also can run on, in parallel on top of Greenplum or Hawk, which means you can access all the popular Java NLP libraries, including Stanford's Core NLP. You can use Open NLP. You can use ArcTweet NLP. So all of these you know, immediately become available in a scalable fashion on top of the Pivotal environment. Great. Um, next question is, is kind of a non-technical question. It's, uh, it's more of a cultural question. Can you talk a little bit about um, kind of the working relationship between application developers and data, science, uh, data scientists um, in these kinds of environments where you're trying to make use of data coming off your applications to improve those applications? Um, traditionally, data scientists and application developers don't necessarily work that close together. Could you talk a little bit about your experience? Absolutely. That's a great question again. So, you know, we spoke about this population, uh, sorry, the skill set pyramid as well, right? So application developers bring a whole new set of skills to the table, and data scientists will have very little overlap with those skills. Uh, we are primarily people who are well versed with data science, statistics, and you know building scalable models. We are not necessarily UX experts or JavaScript experts. So when we work with customers, there is a discovery phase where we are analyzing historical data. You know we are understanding statistical relationships between various features and whatever target you are trying to predict. And for this, we use a lot of the visualization libraries that we had mentioned earlier, like you know there is ggplot, cburn, matplotlib, so on and so forth. These are all static visualizations. Uh, it's it's mostly only to understand interesting relationships, which will help us guide what kind of models we build. And um, these are all embeddable inside Jupyter notebooks, so that when we hand things off to the customer, they understand our reasoning behind you know, the choice of algorithm we picked or why we selected certain features and disregarded certain others. So that's all static visualization, right? So often when we have to uh, demonstrate uh, a dashboard of sorts so that you can communicate your insights from the models to a business audience, we might end up writing a simple application. So it is very simple to write a bare bones application, you know, which uh, creates a dashboard of sorts on top of Pivotal Cloud Foundry. What we've done in our team is we've, we've written boilerplate, boilerplate code which contains some simple visualizations using D3 uh, that can read off of a table you know, with Greenplum being the back end. So for data scientists who are familiar with a little bit of JavaScripting, you can write code to communicate insights from your models. Um, however, when you want you know, more uh, full-fledged functionality in this dashboard with more interactive visualization, we pair up with our application development team. And this is what Pivotal Labs preaches, right? We have apps, you have analytics, and then you have data. And only when these three different components come together, you realize the magic as far as realizing business value is concerned. So you know, in, in, in Pivotal Labs, we frequently work with our application development team where they come up with sketches of you know what the customer desires in the end application. You know they have designers, they have product managers who handle all of that, and their application developers frequently uh, you know work side by side with the data science team, where we agree on an interface that we will uh, you know expose to these app devs. 
Um, for instance, if your model is going to output some sort of a probability score, we will agree on, okay, the output that we are going to expose is this REST API, which when supplied with a certain input is going to give this JSON-like output as the end result. And, you know, the, the app dev team will then tie this into whatever visualization they build uh, using JavaScript. Um, so that's our working relationship with them. And typically in a 12-week project, we, we focus most of our time in building these statistical models. But beyond that point, when it comes to, you know, building this visualization, uh, the application development team then takes it over. And, you know, they have their own estimates of, you know, how long it will take to build an application. But from that point on, they, they, they work closely with us in pulling this over. Mm -hmm. um, and sort of a related question. So is it is, is kind of a prerequisite for, for this kind of software product development um, approach that you're that that you're already using some type some type of agile methodology um, to develop your applications in the first place. In other words, if you were using a more traditional waterfall methodology, it would be very difficult, even if you had data and insights about how people are using your app and perhaps new features you could add to it. It would be very difficult practically to implement them. Um, so does that agile approach that, of course, we talk a lot about here at Pivotal, um, is that kind of a prerequisite for for this data science driven Software product innovation. I I tend to agree with that. Uh, you know, it's not just agile application development. We also do agile data science. Mm -hmm. Often, when we go and try to scope uh, a requirement with a customer, they might have certain you know uh, rough ideas in mind. They wouldn't know what they didn't know. So as we iterate through the data science uh, process. We might find interesting things, and you know, we we have daily touch points with our customers. In addition to stand up calls, we also have a weekly presentation where we focus on a business audience to communicate any interesting things we've found from the data. And often they come back with some suggestions that, hey, perhaps we want it this way, or can you focus on this aspect of of the modeling? And we we can immediately you know accommodate that into our our process because first off the environment is blazingly fast so you know turnaround time for uh, introducing a new feature is very very short and the same applies with the application development team as well they they'll come out with initial sketches based on the discussions with uh, the stakeholders that that is not set in stone you know every day when they present um, you know the the current state of the product they might get feedback saying, hey, perhaps we want this particular widget modified, and they are also able to you know, accommodate that. Ultimately, our goal is to deliver maximal business value to our customers, and Agile has greatly helped us in achieving that. We don't want to build something which the customer is not ultimately happy with you know, three months down the line. That will be a total waste of uh, you know, the customer's time and money. And it would just be an interesting science experiment which has no value. So we we preach and we practice agile approach to both software development as well as data science. Great. Uh, well, we're close on time, so kind of just one last question to wrap up. I mean, if you could give uh, our audience uh, any advice in terms of getting started, um, for, for, let's assume they ne don't necessarily have this kind of uh, relationship set up between data science and application development. What are some initial steps they can take to start the conversation uh, inside their organizations? So the Pivotal blog, um, you know, we, we have a wider Pivotal blog as well as we have an engineering blog. And both of these are great resources for you to learn about how Pivotal works, um, you know, what are some best practices. We have a lot of engineers and data scientists who have written about their experience, you know, working side by side uh, on on customer projects, and there are many such examples you'll find on pivotal.io/blog as well as engineering.pivotal.io. I would encourage you all to go and check that out. In addition to that, we've presented our experiences at several conferences, so you can check those out as well. And um, on, on our, our GitHub page, we have examples of uh, many of our products, um, projects actually, 
which um, you know shows you how uh, you know the the back end environment like Greenplum and Hawk works you know with machine learning libraries like Madlib and how they ultimately can be fed into uh, an application so if you go to uh, you know github um, the pivotal software account on github um, you know we'll we'll also link it later uh, there is uh, you can google for dspcf boilerplate so this is an example of you know a boilerplate um, application we wrote which talks to uh, a data science model in the back end and there are Lots of interesting animated GIFs you will find on, on, on this GitHub page, which shows the art of all that is possible when application developers work closely with data scientists uh, to, to deliver business value. Okay, great. Uh, and, and those of you watching, you also see on your screen uh, some links to other resources uh, that you can, you can tap into. Uh, the Pivotal Data Science Group on LinkedIn, as well as the resources page and, and blog on Pivotal.io uh, that Boston mentioned. So, guys, thank you so much. Uh, that's all the time we have for today. Uh, I'd like to thank Raghu and Watson for their great presentation. And, of course, I'd like to thank you, our audience, for joining us today. Uh, also, be sure to mark your calendars for the next Pivotal Data Science webinar, How to Make Cars Smarter, A Step Towards Self-Driving Cars, uh, which is taking place on October 4th, uh, 2016. So we'll have a registration page live on pivotal.io slash resources soon, um, or keep an eye out on your social media feeds for registration information. Uh, so that's it for now. Thanks again for joining, and we'll see everybody next time. Thank you. Thank you.